Welcome everyone to um, the last webinar in this series. We're going to get started. Um, this one's called Making Long-Term Measurements. We're going to be creating a noise monitoring system that works for you. I'm going to cover some major topics like data storage, remote connection, event and health notification, and more. So I am Danielle Smith. You may recognize my voice from the Larson Davis YouTube videos. I started at LD in 2016 as the technical writer. I've written product manuals for all the new products, and I've made many of the procedural videos. This gave me a really good amount of internal technical knowledge on our products, so it was an easy transition to technical sales specialist at the beginning of this year, which basically means I help our customers align their needs with our products to ensure they get what they need for their projects or applications. Uh, if you'd like to send me a message with any specific questions about the presentation today or any other questions, you can email me here at this address. All right, so here's the overview of what we're going to be covering. Uh, first, we're going to go over a questionnaire, questions you need to ask yourself when you're beginning a long-term measurement project. We're going to talk about cellular data, choosing the best location, uh, remote access, the metrics that you'll need for your project, the data files, and lastly, sound recording. Okay, so you're going to make a long-term measurement. That much is obvious. You have a construction project, you have a noise complaint to your event center, or maybe you're measuring a weekly pattern of wildlife by the shore. Whatever it is, the first questions. I ask when talking to you about this is what are your requirements? Is there a noise ordinance, a legal order? Do you need sound recording, noise exceedance alerts? And what kind of level reading do you need? A weighting, C, Z. This is the first and most important thing to know about your project. It will impact all the other concerns. Then you're going to want to know where and how long you need monitoring. Will you bring out the meter just for the concert, only during the business hours, or will you need to monitor overnight, multiple weeks, months, or even years? The answer to this question will let you know more about the equipment that you're going to need in addition to your sound level meter. Now, what kind of access do you need? In real life access to move files and check the system only remote access, and daily automated file transfer. There are solutions for the smallest to the largest need for access. If you are the only one in your team or, and you will be near the meter during the whole study, remote access and connectivity may not be necessary. But if you have many stakeholders who may be located all over the city uh, or the country or the world, you need them to be able to make changes or look at your data, or whatever it may be, then cellular connectivity may be necessary. Now that you have a better picture of what you're looking for, you need to think about power. Do you have access to AC? Are you okay changing out AA batteries or 12 volt? Or do you want a solar powered system, a self-contained power source? Some people don't mind keeping a set of batteries and switching them out, while others don't want to have to be chasing a voltage level. Uh, we have customers that will run an AC line to the system, while others prefer the solar panel, so it is more mobile or self-contained. And lastly, budget. I put this last instead of first because oftentimes the budget can be adjusted to meet the requirements, and so you know where you might need to lose features or what features you cannot lose. So you have your requirements, your needs, and your wish list, and then finally you weigh this with the budget. Know what you need and know what you want, and then you start to build the appropriate system from there. The main components of long-term measurement can now be determined once you get the scope of your project worked out. The most important element is the sound level meter. Which one you choose will have to do with what you are measuring and what you need out of it, but you cannot monitor sound without it. Second is the power source. Third is an environmentally protected case. This deters thefts, 
protects from the elements and makes for easy relocation of all of your components. And then you will need to protect the microphone. You need, it to, pre you need to protect it from wind and rain mostly. To learn more about microphone protection, you can watch our previous webinar in this series, Five Pitfalls of Noise Monitoring. Ken Cox, our product manager, goes over the specifics and the science of microphone protection. That video is on our YouTube channel. So here's a popular setup for noise monitoring. You have your microphone extended with a cable on like a telescopic pole and a solar panel to keep the system powered. And inside the case, you store the battery, the charge controller, uh, the sound level meter, and in, if you want to do any remote connection, the cellular gateway modem is the route to go. So let's talk more about the modem. Giving the system its own way to communicate to the outside world is a highly popular model. With the modem, you purchase a SIM card. When we work with people on their connectivity, we found that Verizon and AT&T have the best service in most areas. Uh, each of them, though, they offer different ways of selling their plan, so it's good to do research. A uh, four to five gig month of plan with data only is all you'll need for, for noise monitoring. It's uh, roughly $40 a month bill for most providers. Next, it is necessary to have a static IP address. In order to get this, each provider does it differently, either charging you a setup fee for a business license or an activation fee. Even though they are labeled different, the end goal is the same, to get the static IP address. You won't be able to find the system without it. And lastly, make sure you get your APN. This is an access point name that you would enter into the modem so it can access the service on the card. This is usually not an additional fee. You just need to ensure that you ask for what it is. Okay, so you will need to consider your location early on. Some of our customers print out an overhead view of the location. They spend time in the location physically to understand it, or they do noise surveys of the multiple locations they are considering before the official noise monitoring even begins. So ensure the space you are choosing will have the proper clearance for the equipment. Don't place near trees, walls, or parked cars. You'll run into problems of noise reflection that may affect the reliability of your data. And lastly, if you don't want noise to be measured, stay clear of that source. That's like garbage cans, smoking areas, exhaust exchanges, water drains. I've seen a toilet flushing nearby show up in data. AC units turning on and off throughout the day is another very common one. Also, vacuum cleaners or lawn mowers sometimes throw things off as well. Know what you don't want as much as what you do. If you have a solar panel, you'll need to make sure it has an unobstructed view of the sun. You may think that cloudy days are bad for solar panels, but it's really not a big deal for them. The big worries are shade, like from walls or trees. Uh, there was one customer we had who had problems with their solar panel only in the summer. Turns out the leaves on the tree nearby shaded the panels too much in the summer, but in the winter it was clear enough. Now I cannot tell you where to put your microphone unless I knew the details of the site, but I'm going to show you this example so you can relate it to your application to help understand kind of the basics of microphone location. So this is a real world example of what kind of noises can be picked up by the mic. So the yellow star that you'll see here is where the microphone is located. It's on top of a 19 foot pole. It's actually our NMS 045 permanent system. Uh, the green triangle is where the trash cans are and a loading dock. The large trucks coming into the parking lot often trigger a noise exceedance um, as well as trash pickup. So I have a recording that our microphone made last Tuesday during trash pickup. As you can hear, even though the microphone is located here and the trash can is over here, 
it exceeds our 65 decibel trigger level with a minimum duration of three seconds and initiates an event. Um, also, if you look down here, this is where the train tracks are. And about every hour throughout the day, a train goes by and blows their whistle. It makes a really neat sound, and, and it's picked up really well on our mic. And then the last sound that I picked out for you is police sirens, that they pull over people on this road right here quite often. It's a speed trap. So if you listen here. Actually, that sounded like an ambulance. So this is to give you an idea of what kind of sounds you might get if you were to put the microphone in this location. If you were looking for sounds from the trucks coming into the parking lot, this is a great location for it but you might pick up other things as well. If you were looking for train signs or train sounds, perhaps putting the microphone close to the train tracks would be better, and then it might eliminate any sounds from any of these other areas. So make sure that you place your microphone near the sounds that you are looking for. Now, not all is lost if you're picking up noise that you don't want. So masking out noise events unrelated to the study is very common practice. If you have sound recordings for those events, you can identify them and mask them in software that comes with it. We have a G4 software that, with a masking feature for the unwanted noises in your study. So typical monitoring requirements are LN, one second time history with specific met metrics, trigger levels for events, and additionally there are multiple trigger sources like running LEQ, there is also LDN data. So you ask yourself at the beginning, what are the requirements? And knowing what kind of data you need is paramount. So these are screenshots from a sound level meter setup page um, to kind of give you an idea. Often a noise consultant or a court order might use different language to describe the same metric. So it's best to choose a manufacturer of a sound level meter and go through what it calls out as their match metrics and align it with what you need to do. There are industry standards, so most of the time the discrepancy is an ordinance that chooses not to use the standard language. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we have seen numerous customers and their requirements, and there are hardly any outliers. In other words, you may not be as unique as you think. The sound level meter most likely has the capabilities that you're looking for. If I haven't covered something that you need or want, uh, you can contact LB and we'll see what we can do, or you can even ask at the end of this presentation. So alerts and notifications. This is a great feature of a system if you have a modem. Think about the stakeholders in your noise survey or the neighbors to a concert venue, the noise consultants at a construction site, or the students involved in an environmental study, and knowing in real time when there is a noise exceedance. Depending on the capabilities of your sound level meter, you can add their emails or cell numbers to the recipient list on the meter. And once a noise event is finished, they all receive a notification. Uh, you can even set up a reply to email address so they can communicate with the project lead. And alerts can be more than just noise exceedances as well. They could be health alerts, like low memory, or if somebody changes settings, uh, power, or if the file may be failed to upload to a server. Most cases, you don't want to be hands-on with data collection, like going to the meter itself every day and saving off a file onto a computer. Some systems can be set up to save off the files into a Dropbox or SFTP server. Uh, the file can be copied in both the meter and the cloud or transferred straight over. You should ask your manufacturer of your noise monitoring equipment if they have access to your data as well, or if you're able to control and monitor your own data and where it is stored. All right, so creating jumbo files is a very common issue with people running into long-term noise monitoring. Some meters will warn you when you might be making too big of files and filling your memory too fast. But here are some quick tips 
for avoiding running into the issue altogether in case you don't have a system warning. First off, save off your file daily. Second, if you are doing any sound recording, which is the biggest culprit, enable compression. It will save your life. Another way it can fill up is your time history samples. Most situations call for a one second time history sample. And this is more than sufficient for creating graphs or understanding what is happening with your data. But if for whatever reason you need faster time histories, it's gonna fill up your memory very fast. In that case, try to save off the file more than once a day and perhaps even hourly. As a side note, if you need the file to show a whole day and you've made several files for that day, some software like RG4 is capable of combining multiple files into one, so that shouldn't be too much of a worry. Now, when you do time history samples, um, and you, you select metrics with those samples, and if you have selected like OBA data, which is our octave band um, data, then that's gonna use up a lot of bits at an exponential rate. So again, save off your file more than once a day. And lastly, after the files moved off of memory and saved, either to the meter or USB, you can maybe pack up your USB or your internal st storage really quickly. So clean it up. Push those files to the cloud as you make them or, um, or manually download them onto a PC. Some people will copy to the cloud and then check in on their system like weekly and delete the internal files manually. Though this isn't necessary, but it might be good for peace of mind. You don't have, um, if you don't have connectivity for your system, saving off the files onto your PC weekly is a good idea. All right, so sound recording option opens up a lot of features. It's best to start with what you want and then set up the meter to match. So some requirements for noise monitoring ask for continuous sound. Additionally, there is event sound. This is what we call triggering a sound recording with a noise exceedance. This can be sent in an email notification as well. And while a file is being created, you can play back the noise files in the session log on the meter during the measurement. Uh, I sometimes do this to check out a notification that I got. And finally, I can't stress this enough, compress your sound. Also, most meters <clears throat> have uh, sound recording capabilities will also have audio streaming capabilities. It, it's a way to access your meter and hear the current area's sound. This feature may make you reconsider the location as you'll need to be wary of privacy issues. However, it is a handy tool for checking in on a meter that is giving odd readings or perhaps, like perhaps a person has put like their hand on the mic or wildlife has decided to take too much interest in the equipment then you'll be able to listen in and see what's going on. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar. Thanks so much everybody for joining us and you guys have a great day.